James Watt by Andrew Carnegie Chapter Six Part One Removal to Birmingham Watt's permanent settlement in Birmingham had for some time been seen to be inevitable, all his time being needed there. Domestic matters, including the care of his two children, with which he had hitherto been burdened, pressed hard upon him, and he had been greatly depressed by finding his old father quite in his dotage, although he was not more than seventy-five. Watt was alone and very unhappy during a visit he made to Greenock. Before returning to Birmingham he married Miss MacGregor, daughter of a Glasgow man of affairs, who was the first in Britain to use chlorine for bleaching, the secret of which Bertholet, its inventor, had communicated to Watt. Pending the marriage, it was advisable that the partnership with Bolton as hitherto agreed upon should be executed. Watt writes so to Bolton, and the arrangement between the partners is indicated by the following passage of Watt's letter to him. As you may have possibly mislaid my missive to you concerning the contract, I beg just to mention what I remember of the terms. 1. I to assign to you two-thirds of the property of the invention. 2. You to pay all expenses of the act or others incurred before June 1775, the date of the act, and also the expense of future experiments, which money is to be sunk without interest by you, being the consideration you pay for your share. 3 you to advance stock in trade bearing interest, but having no claim on me for any part of that, further than my intromissions, the stock itself to be your security and property. 4. I to draw one-third of the profits so soon as any arise from the business, after paying the workmen's wages and goods furnished, but abstract from the stock in trade, excepting the interest thereof, which is to be deducted before a balance is struck. 5. I to make drawings, give directions, and make surveys, the company paying for the travelling expenses to either of us upon engine business. 6. You to keep the books and balance them once a year. 7. A book to be kept wherein to be marked such transactions as are worthy of record, which, when signed by both, to have the force of the contract. 8. Neither of us to alienate our share of the other, and if either of us by death or otherwise shall be incapacitated from acting for ourselves, the other of us to be the sole manager without contradiction or interference of heirs, executors, assignees, or others, but the books to be subject to their inspection, and the acting partner of us to be allowed a reasonable commission for extra trouble. 9. The contract to continue in force for twenty-five years, from the first of June, 1775, when the partnership commenced, notwithstanding the contract being of later date. 10. Our heirs, executors, and assignees bound to observance. 11. In case of demise of both parties, our heirs, etc., to succeed in same manner, and if they all please, they may burn the contract. If anything be very disagreeable in these terms, you will find me disposed to do everything reasonable for your satisfaction." Bolton's reply was entirely satisfactory, and upon this basis the arrangement was closed. Watt, with his usual want of confidence in himself in business affairs, was anxious that Bolton should come to him to Glasgow and arrange all pecuniary matters connected with the marriage. Watt had faced the daughter and conquered but trembled at the thought of facing the father-in-law. He appeals to his partner as follows. I am afraid that I shall otherwise make a very bad bargain in money matters, which wise men like you esteem the most essential part, and I myself, although I be an enamoured swain, do not altogether despise. You may perhaps think it odd that in the midst of my friends here I should call for your help. But the fact is that from several reasons I do not choose to place that confidence in any of my friends here that would be necessary in such a case, and I do not know any of them that have more to say with the gentleman in question than I have myself. Besides, you are the only person who can give him satisfactory information concerning my situation. This being impracticable, as explained by Bolton, who thoroughly approved of the Union, the partnership and Bolton's letter were accepted by the judicious father-in-law as satisfactory evidence that his daughter's future was secure. Bolton states in his letter, July 1776, It may be difficult to say what is the value of your property in partnership with me. However, I will give it a name, 
and I do say that I would willingly give you two or perhaps three thousand pounds for your assignment of your third part of the Act of Parliament. But I should be sorry to make you so bad a bargain, or to make any bargain at all that tended to deprive me of your friendship, acquaintance, and assistance, hoping that we shall harmoniously live to wear out the twenty-five years, which I had rather do than gain a nabob's fortune by being the sole proprietor. This is the kind of expression from the heart to make a partner happy and resolve to do his utmost for one who in the recipient's heart had transposed positions, and is now friend first, and partner afterward. The marriage took place in July 1776. Two children were born, both of whom died in youth. Mrs. Watt lived until a ripe old age, and enjoyed the fruits of her husband's success and fame. She died in 1832. Arago praises her, and says various talents, sound judgment, and strength of mind rendered her a worthy companion. It is difficult to realize that many yet with us were contemporaries of Mrs. Watt, and not a few yet living were contemporaries of Watt himself, for he did not pass away until 1819, eighty-six years ago. So much a thing of yesterday is the material development and progress of the world, which had its basis, start, and accomplishment in the steam-engine. The reasons given by Bolton for being unable to proceed to the side of his friend and partner in Glasgow shed clear light upon the condition of affairs at Soho. Their London agent, like Watt, was also to be married, and would be absent. Father Gill had to proceed to London, scale one of the managers was absent, important visitors were constantly arriving. Said Bolton, Our copper bottom hath plagued us very much by steam leaks, and therefore I have had one cast with its conducting pipe all in one piece, since which the engine doth not take more than ten feet of steam, and I hope to reduce that quantity, as we have just received the new piston, which shall be put in and at work to-morrow. Our Soho engine never was in such good order as at present. Bloomfield and Willie engines are both well, and I doubt not but Bow engine will be better than any of them. He concludes, I did not sleep last night, my mind being absorbed by steam. Means for increasing the heating surface swept through his mind by applying, in copper spheres within the water, the present flue system, also for working steam expansively, being clear the principle is sound. To add to Bolton's anxieties, he had received a summons to attend the Solicitor General next week in opposition to Gainsborough, a clergyman who claimed to be the original inventor. This is a disagreeable circumstance, particularly at this season, when you are absent. Harrison is in London, and idleness is in our engine-shop." Watt wrote Bolton on July 28, 1776, apologizing for his long absence, and stating he was now ready to return, and would start Tuesday first for Liverpool, where he expected to meet Bolton. Meanwhile, the latter had been called to London by the Gainsborough business. A note from him, however, reached Watt at Liverpool, in which he says, "'As to your absence, say nothing about it. I will forgive it this time, provided you promise me never to marry again." In due time Mr. and Mrs. Watt arrived and settled early in August, 1776, in Birmingham, which was hereafter to be their permanent home, although, as we shall see, Watt never ceased to keep in close touch with his native town of Greenock and his Glasgow friends. His heart still warmed to the tartan, the soft, broad Scotch accent never forsook him, nor, we may be sure, did the refrain ever leave his heart, and may dishonour blot our name, and quench our household fires, if me or mine forget thy name, thou dear land of my sires. Many a famous Scot has the fair South in recent times called to her, Stevenson, Ruskin, Carlyle, Mill, Gladstone, and others, but never before or since one whose work was the transformation of the world. At last we have Watt permanently settled alongside the great works to which he was hereafter to devote his rare abilities until his retirement at the expiration of the partnership in 1800. His labors at Soho soon began to tell. The works increased their celebrity beyond all others then known, for materials, workmanship, and invention. The mines of Cornwall promised to become unworkable. Indeed, many already had become so. The Newcomen engines, could no longer drain the deepened mines. Several orders for Watt engines had been received, and as much depended upon the success of the first, Watt resolved to superintend its erection himself. Mrs. Watt and he started over the terrible road into Cornwall, 
and had to take up their abode with the superintendent of the mine, there being no other house for miles around. Naturally, the builders and attendants of the Newcomen engine viewed Watt's invasion of their district with no kindly feelings. Great jealousy arose, and Watt's sensitive nature was sorely tried. Many attempts to thwart him were met with, and taken altogether, his life in Cornwall was far from agreeable. The engine was erected, the day of trial came, mining men, engineers, mining proprietors, and others assembled from all quarters to see the start. Many of the spectators interested in other engines would not have shed tears had it failed, but it started splendidly, making eleven eight-foot strokes per minute, which broke the record. Three cheers for the Scotch engineer! It soon worked with greater power and more steadily, and forked more water than the ordinary engines with only about one-third the consumption of coal. Watt wrote, I understand all the West Country captains are to be here to-morrow to see the prodigy. The velocity, violence, magnitude, and horrible noise of the engine give universal satisfaction to all beholders, believers or not. I have once or twice trimmed the engine to end the stroke gracefully, and to make less noise, but Mr. Wilson cannot sleep without it seems quite furious, so I have left it to the engineman and, by the by, the noise seems to convey great ideas of its power to the ignorant, who seem to be no more taken with modest merit in an engine than in a man. Well said, modest, reserved philosopher, with vast horsepower in that big head of yours, working in the closet noiselessly, driving deep but silently into the bosom of nature's secrets, pumping her deepest minds, discovering and bringing to the surface the genius which lay in steam to do your bidding and revolutionize life on earth. In this, the first triumph, there was recompense for all the trials Watt and his wife had endured in Cornwall. Readers will note that no workman had yet been developed who could be trusted to erect the engine. The master inventor had to go himself as the mechanical genius certain to cure all defects and ensure success. This shows how indispensable Watt was. Orders now flowed in, and Watt was needed to prepare the plans and drawings, no one being capable of relieving him of this. Today we have draftsmen by the thousand to whom it would be easy routine work as we have thousands to whom the erection of the Watt engine would be play. Watt was everywhere. At length he had to confess that a very little more of this hurrying and vexation would knock me up altogether. At this moment he had just been called to return to Cornwall to erect the second engine. He says, I fancy I must be cut in pieces and a portion sent to every tribe in Israel. We may picture him reciting in Falstaffian mood, would my name were not so terrible to the enemy, deep mine water, as it is. There can't a drowned-out mine peep its head out, but I'm thrust upon it. Well, well, it always was the trick of my countrymen to make a good thing too common. Better rust to death than be scoured to nothing by this perpetual motion. Watt had a hard time of it in Cornwall during his next stay there, for he had to go again. He arrives at Redruth to find many troubles. Forbes' eduction pipe is a vile job, he writes, and full of holes. The cylinder they have cast for chase water is still worse, for it will hardly do at all. The Soho people have sent here chase water pipe instead of wheel union, and the gudgeon pipe has not arrived with the nozzles. These repeated disappointments will ruin our credit in the country, and I cannot stay here to bear the shame of such failures of promise. It is easy for present-day captains of industry to plume themselves upon their ability to select men sure to succeed well with any undertaking, and assume that Watt lacked the indispensable talent for selection, but he had been driven by sad experience to trust none but himself, the skilled workmen needed to cooperate with him not yet having been developed. We have not touched upon another source of great anxiety to him at this time. The enterprising Bolton would not have been the organizer he was unless blessed with a sanguine disposition and the capacity for shedding troubles. The business was rapidly extending in many branches, all needing capital. The engine business, promising though it was, was no exception. Little money was yet due from sales, and much had been spent developing the invention. Bolton's letter to Watt constantly urged cash collections, while mine owners were not disposed to pay until further tests were made. Bolton suggested loans from Truro bankers on security of the engines, but Watt found this impracticable. The engines were doing astonishingly well to-day, but who could ensure their lasting qualities? 
Watt shows good judgment in suggesting that Wilkinson, the famous foundryman, should be taken into partnership. He urges his enterprising partner to apply the pruning knife and cut down expenses, naively assuring him that he was practicing all the frugality in his power. As Watt's personal expenses then were only ten dollars per week, a smile rises at the prudent Scot's possible contribution to reduction in expenditure. But he was on the right lines, and at least gave Bolton the benefit of example. Watt was never disposed to look on the bright side of things, and to add to Bolton's load, the third partner, Fothergill, was even more desponding than Watt. When Bolton went away to raise means he was pursued by letters from Fothergill telling him day by day of imperative needs. In one he was of opinion that the creditors must be called together, better to face the worst than go on in the neck-and-neck -neck race with ruin. Bolton would hurry back to quiet Fothergill and keep the ship afloat. Here he shines out resplendently. He proved equal to the emergency. His courage and determination rose in proportion to the difficulties to be overcome, borne up by his invariable hope and unshakable belief in the value of Watt's condensing engine. He triumphed at last, pledging as security for a loan of seventy thousand dollars, the royalties derivable from the engine patents, and an annuity for a loan of thirty-five thousand more. So small a sum as one hundred five thousand dollars sufficed to keep afloat the big ship laden with all their treasures. There was a period of great depression in Britain, when Bolton and Watt were thus in deep water, and at such times credit is sensitive in the extreme. A small balance on the right side performs wonders. This recalls to the writer how, once in the history of his own firm, credit was kept high during a panic by using the identical sum Bolton raised, seventy thousand dollars, from a reserve fund that had been laid away and came in very opportunely at the critical time. Every single dollar weighs a hundredfold when credit trembles in the balance. A leading nerve specialist in New York once said that the worst malady he had to treat was the man of affairs whose credit was suspected. His unfailing remedy was, call your creditors together, explain all, and ask their support. I can then do you some good, but not till then. His patients who did this found themselves restored to vigor. They were supported by creditors, and all was bright once more. The wise doctor was sound in his advice. If the firm has neither speculated nor gambled synonymous terms, nor lived extravagantly, nor endorsed for others, and the business is on a solid foundation, no people have so much at stake in sustaining it as the creditors. They will rally round it, and think more of the firm than ever, because they will see behind their money the best of all securities, men at the helm, who are not afraid and know how to meet a storm. Bolton's timid partners no doubt were amazed that he was so blind to the dangers which they with clearer vision saw so clearly. How deluded they were! We may be sure neither of them saw the danger half as vividly as he, but it is not the part of a leader to reveal to his fellows all that he sees or fears. His part is to look dangers steadily in the face and challenge them. It is the great leader who inspires in his followers contempt for the danger which he sees in much truer proportion than they. This Bolton did, for behind all else in his character there lay the indomitable will, the do-or-die resolve. He had staked his life upon the hazard of a die, and he would stand the cost. But if we fail, often said the timid pair to him, as Macbeth did to his resolute partner, and the same answer came, we fail. That's all. One knockdown will not finish this fight. We'll get up again, never fear. We know no such word as fail. Footnote. Perhaps there is no instance so striking as this of the immense difference that sometimes lies in the mere accent given one monosyllable. Until Mrs. Siddons revealed the real Lady Macbeth, every actress had replied, We fail? Interrogatively, and then encouragingly, Screw your courage to the sticking point, and we'll not fail. Such the commonplace reciters. When genius touched the word, it flashed and sparkled. Then came the prompt response, we fail. She was of such stuff as meets failure without fear. For this revelation the actress becomes immortal, since her name is linked with the greatest son of time. One word did it, nay a new accent upon a monosyllable. A trifling change, say you? I make it a rule never to mind trifles, said a great man. So should I, if I could only tell what were trifles, said a greater. One is far on if he can predict consequences that may flow from one kind word or the intonation of a word. 
Fortune sometimes hangs upon a glance or a nod of kindly recognition as we pass. End footnote. One source of serious trouble arose from Watt and Bolton, having been so anxious at first to introduce their engines that they paid small regard to terms. When their success was proved, they offered to settle, taking one-third the value of the fuel saved. This was a liberal offer, for, in addition to the mine owners saving two-thirds of the former cost of fuel consumed by the previous engines, mines became workable, which without the Watt engine must have been abandoned. These terms, however, were not accepted, and a long series of disputes arose, ending in some cases only with the patent right itself. It was resolved that all future engines should be furnished only upon the terms before stated, Watt declaring that otherwise he would not put pen to paper to make new drawings. Let our terms be moderate, he writes, and if possible consolidated into money a priori, and it is certain we shall get some money, enough to keep us out of jail in continual apprehension of which I live at present. Imprisonment for debt, let it be remembered, had not been abolished. One of the most beneficent forward steps that our time can boast of is the bankruptcy court. However hard we may yet be upon offenders against us, society, through human laws, forgives our debtors in money matters, and gives a clear bill of health after honorable acquittal in bankruptcy, and a fresh start. The result proved Watt's wisdom. His engines were needed to save the mines. No other could. Applications came in freely upon his terms, and as Watt was a poor hand at bargaining, he insisted that Bolton should come to Cornwall and attend to that part. Meanwhile, great attention was being paid to the works and all pertaining to the men and methods. The firm established perhaps the first benefit society of workmen. Every one was a member, and contributed according to his earnings. Out of this fund, payments were made to the sick or disabled in varying amounts. No member of the Soho Friendly Society, except a few irreclaimable drunkards, ever came upon the parish. When Bolton's son came of age, seven hundred were dined. No well-behaved workman was ever turned adrift. Fathers employed introduced their sons into the works and brought them up under their own eye, watching over their conduct and mechanical training. Thus generation after generation followed each other at Soho Works. On another occasion Bolton writes Watt in Cornwall, I have thought it but respectful to give our folks a dinner to-day. There were present Murdoch, Lawson, Pearson, Perkins, Malcolm, Robert Muir, all Scotchmen, John Bull, and Wilson and Self, for the engines are now all finished and the men have behaved well and are attached to us. Six Scotch and three English in the English works of Soho thought worthy of dining with their employer. It was, we may be sure, a very rare occurrence in that day, but worthy of the true captain of industry. Here is an early invasion from the north. We are reminded of Sir Charles Dilke's statement in his Greater Britain, that in his tour around the world he found ten Scotchmen for every Englishman in high position. Owing, of course, to the absence of scope at home, the Scot has had to seek his career abroad. A master-stroke this, probably the first dinner of its kind in Britain, and no doubt more highly appreciated by the honoured guests than an advance in wages. Splendid workmen do not live upon wages alone. Appreciation felt and shown by their employer, as in this case, is the coveted reward. We have read how Watt was much troubled in Scotland with poor mechanics. Not one good craftsman could he then find. After seeing Soho, where the standard was much higher, he declared that the Scotch mechanic was very much inferior. He was prejudiced against them. Murdoch, however, the first Scot at Soho, soon eclipsed all, and no doubt under his wing other Scots gained a trial with the result indicated. It is very significant that even in the earliest days of the steam-engine, Scotchmen should exhibit such talent for its construction, forecasting their present preeminence in marine engineering. Small wonder that the Soho works became the model for all others. The last words in Bolton's letter, and are attached to us, tell the story. No danger of strikes, of lockouts, or quarrels of any kind in such establishment as that of Bolton and Watt, who proved that they in turn were attached to their men. Mutual attachment between employers and employed is the panacea for all troubles. Yes, better than a panacea, the preventer of troubles. After repeated calls from Watt, Bolton took the journey to Cornwall in October 1778, although Father Gill was again uttering lamentable prophecies of impending ruin, 
and the London agent was imploring his presence there upon financial matters pressing in the extreme. Bolton succeeded in borrowing ten thousand dollars from Truro bankers on the security of engines erected, and settled several disputes, getting three thousand five hundred dollars per year royalty for one engine, and two thousand dollars per year for another. At last, after nine years of arduous labor since the invention was hailed as successful, the golden harvest so long expected began to replenish the empty treasury. The heavy liabilities, however, remained a source of constant anxiety. No remedy could be found against this consumption of the purse. Watt had again to encounter the lack of competent, sober workmen to run engines. The Highland blood led him at last into severe measures, and he insisted upon discharging two or three of the most drunken. Here Bolton had great difficulty in restraining him. Much had to be endured, and the occasional bouts of drunkenness overlooked, although serious accidents resulted. At last two men appeared whose services proved invaluable, Murdoch, already mentioned, and Law, one of whom became famous. Watt was absent when the former called and asked Bolton for employment. The young Scot was the son of a well-known millwright near Ayr, who had made several improvements. His famous son worked with him, but being ambitious and hearing of the fame of Bolton and Watt, he determined to seek entrance to Soho Works, and learn the highest order of handicraft. Bolton had told him that there was at present no place open, but noticing the strange cap the awkward young man had been dangling in his hands, he asked what it was made of. Timmer said the lad. What, out of wood? Yes. How was it made? I turned it myself in a bit of lathy of my own making. This was enough for that rare judge of men. Here was a natural-born mechanic, certain. The young man was promptly engaged for two years at fifteen shillings per week, when in shop, seventeen shillings when abroad, and eighteen shillings when in London. His history is the usual march upward until he became his employer's most trusted manager in all their mechanical operations. While engaged upon one critical job where the engine had defied previous attempts to put it to rights, the people in the house where Murdoch lodged were awakened one night by heavy tramping in his room overhead. Upon entering, Murdoch was seen in his bedclothes, heaving away at the bedpost in his sleep, calling out, Now she goes, lads, now she goes. His heart was in his work. He had a mission, and only one, to make that engine go. Of course he rose. There's no holding down such a dreamer anywhere in this world. It was not only that he had zeal, for he had sense with it, and was not less successful in conquering the rude Cornishmen who had baffled, annoyed, and intimidated Watt. He won their hearts. His ability did not end with curing the defects of machinery. He knew how to manage men. At first he had to depend upon his physical powers. He was an athlete not indisposed to lead the strenuous life. He had not been very long in Cornwall, before half a dozen of the mining captains, a class that had tormented poor, retiring, and modest Watt, entered the engine-room and began their bullying tricks on him. The Scotch blood was up. Murdoch quietly locked the door and said to the captains, "'Now then, gentlemen, you shall not leave until we have settled matters once for all.' He selected the biggest Cornishman and squared off. The contest was soon over. Murdoch vanquished the bully and was ready for the next. The captains, seeing the kind of man he was, offered terms of peace. Hands were shaken all round, and they parted good friends, and remained so. We are past that rude age. The skilled, educated manager of to-day can use no weapon so effectively with skilled men as the supreme force of gentleness, the manner, language, and action of the educated man, even to the calm, low voice never raised to passionate pitch. He conquers and commands others because he has command of himself. End of chapter 6, part 1